I can see nothing but uh, a great future and, a, and uh, great football games uh, in future years. Just imagine over 65,000 fans filling Cougar Stadium every game day, but it hasn't always been that way, at least not until Lavelle Edwards joined Brigham Young. Now in his 22nd year, the Cougars have enjoyed 19 consecutive winning seasons. Only Oklahoma and Nebraska can boast better records. Right now, let's take a look at the man, the myth, and the legend, Lavelle Edwards. It is a look that never seems to change. The stern, ice-cool face of determination etched by the seasons. Those seasons have brought him greatness and fame. But the success has not changed the humble farm boy known to his teammates as Hard Nose. And one of the nicest things about looking at him now, and uh, he's the same guy that he was in 1951 and 50 when I knew him on the football field. For Lavelle Edwards, sports may have been a break from farm chores. He and his brother picked strawberries not far from the BYU Stadium. He made his mark in track at Lincoln High School, and he also played basketball during his high school days. But football was his passion, and it won in three letters in the job of captain of the Utah State Aggies in 1951. 42 football seasons later, there is a reunion of some of those Aggies. It's good to see you. Thank good to see you. The reunion comes as the Cougars prepare to meet UCLA in the Rose Bowl, a stark difference from what the 1950 Aggies considered a big-time road trip. Our biggest outing was, as you say, the outside of Brigham, the, what was the place oh. we stopped eating? You know, the oh, steakhouse. Maddox. 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 Maddox, that was yeah. our big deal. Yeah. George Milinkovich was their coach in 1950, a former All-American at Notre Dame. Jim DiGiuseppe, a retired judge in Tarzana, California, was a linebacker for the Aggies that year, and Devan Robbins played on the offensive unit with Lavelle Edwards. I played in, and Lavelle was both center, offensive center, and, uh, and uh, then he played linebacker. And he, he was an exceptional football player. There's no question about that. His coach says Lavelle was all heart. He had to be, Milinkovic adds, because he wasn't that big. But Lavelle Edwards, he remembers, was a fierce competitor. Oh, he played played for keeps. I mean, he was really did everything possible to win a ball game. He wouldn't quit, and they went both ways in those days. Outmatched in size, there were times when Lavelle would take a pounding. One night in particular, a nose tackle named Punjab worked hard nose over. What you do is both arms would come way back here, underneath Lavelle as soon as he snapped the ball, and Lavelle would come flying up and you know back back into the backfield. Well, the Faro guy just beat up the bill the whole game. And after the game, old Punjab came over and said, you're a tough little rascal. <laughs> but that's the toughness, it. his friends and teammates say, was eclipsed only by his determination. The fact that the farm boy from Orem made the big time surprised none of them. And as they wished him well on the floor of the Rose Bowl, 40 years seemed to have changed little about the teammate they remembered in the trenches. Proud, determined, and hard-nosed. He hasn't changed one bit as far as his outlook toward people. He's just a heck of a nice guy. 
he hasn't changed a bit. He's still the same guy he was, in spite of all his success and that. He's the same guy. He's a wonderful person. To understand the man, the coach, the person, you have to start from the beginning. Lavelle Edwards was a player coach during his Army days at Fort Meade, Maryland. He returned to Utah in 1954 and became head coach at Granite High School. The big break came in 1962. Hal Mitchell added Edwards to his staff at BYU and remained when Tom Hudspeth took over in 1964. Eight years later, Edwards was running the show. I knew that I wanted to give it a shot. And in fact, at the time, I was almost had my, um, my doctorate uh, of education finished. And I decided to go ahead and complete it uh, because it wasn't a matter of uh, if I was going to get fired. It was just a matter of when I was going to get fired. Then I... That's a word BYU Edwards will never hear at BYU. 15 WAC championships and 15 bowl games have a way of putting that sort of thing off. And for Edwards, his success began when he hired a guy from Tennessee named Dewey Warren. He was the architect behind BYU's passing attack. The ball, but now I understand we're going to try and throw it. You're going to throw the ball? We're going to throw the ball. We're going to throw a lot of passes. I, I believe that's what we said. I'm not sure. Dewey Warren, the new quarterback coach from Tennessee. And uh, what, what are you going to do with that ball? Oh, well, we're going to throw the ball. We <laughs> might not complete it, but we're going to The second year we then the, was when we really started to throw the football a lot. A kid named Gary Scheide, and that was, ironically was the only losing year we've had. We were five and six that year, and so, but we stayed with it, and then of course, as they say, the rest is history. History will show Edwards coached the most impressive list of quarterbacks to play college football. Scheide, Nielsen, Wilson, McMahon, Young, Bosco, and Detmer. Each one provided Edwards with their own golden moments. But the man provided a heart stopper in the 1980 Holiday Bowl against SMU. When uh, Clay Brown uh, went up for the ball and just a mass of people went up and then all of a sudden there was a, a pause down there and there was almost a, a, a feeling I remember going through my mind that, you know, we, I think we caught that. You know, all you couldn't see anything because of the hesitation. And all of a sudden you, Eric Lane came out of there with his arms in the air. And then shortly after that, then uh, the referee stood up with his arms near. Of course, in all pandemonium broke loose. And that winter, we had a lot of, a lot of great stories. Uh, I remember speaking somewhere some time, and a guy said, um, stood up and he said, Lavelle, he said, how'd it feel to have a couple of Catholic boys win the game for you? And uh, that's when uh, Jim McMahon threw it to Clay Brown. And uh, I told the guy, I says, well, actually, I said, all they did was tie the game. It took a return missionary, Kurt Gunther, to win it. He kicked the extra point. Four years later, Edwards realized every coach's dream, a national championship. His quarterback, Robbie Bosco. We just kept self-destructing all night long. You know, we turned the ball over, I think, five or six times that night. And uh, then, of course, Robbie got hurt. And, uh, he came back out, and they said that uh, uh, they've got him wrapped up so tightly, and it's almost like a cast, and he can't really hurt the leg anymore. So. If we wanted to use him, we could, and we put him back into wishbone, in which he hadn't, we hadn't really practiced all that much, and he couldn't hear much. And, and uh, Robbie played there and put on one of the more gutty performances I think I've, uh, I've ever seen a kid put on. Another gutty kid came Lavelle's way in 1988, Ty Detmer, and three years later, won the Heisman. I really felt like that, uh, that he was going to get it, but I was also, uh, nervous that, that, that it just can't happen at, at BYU. We were, of course, sitting there, and he was wired up, and he could hear. We couldn't. We got we it. Him in and said, I got it. And, uh, and uh, that, was, that was a very, very big night. And Edwards hopes there are more big nights ahead. Retirement is near, but not yet. When it does come, what are you going to do? Well, I think one thing, I'd probably like to go on a mission and uh, didn't go when I was younger, and so Patty and I will probably go somewhere. But I think the time will come uh, that it's time to, to uh, step aside, and I think when that time does come, then I think I'll know it.
It is amazing the years that have gone by. The man behind the coach, Lavelle Edwards, the games, the great games that have been played on this field. All of us have memories of those moments. Lee Benson, the sports editor of the Deseret News. Maybe what are some of your earliest memories of Lavelle Edwards? Well, you know, actually I go back to uh, as a student here at BYU when Lavelle Edwards got the head job in 1972. I wrote for the school newspaper, the Daily Universe. And, and I remember Tom Hudspeth was, was fired and Lavelle Edwards uh, lobbied for the job. He lobbied pretty hard. He even lobbied the student writers, which included myself and, and Dave Gunn, who was the sports editor at the time. So it goes clear back, I guess, to the start. He wanted it bad, huh? He wanted the job badly. And I think uh, nobody at that time knew just how badly he not only wanted it, but how, how much he wanted to win. You know, Lee, here's a guy who sits around on the sidelines with his arms folded. His, his natural scowl kind of comes down like that. But, you know, the guy is uh, he's friendly. He uh, knows football, back front of his hand. Uh, the, the scowl really is not the guy that really who is Lavelle Edwards, is he? I don't, I don't know that anybody could define Lavelle Edwards. He seems like the epitome of the uh, still waters run deep cliche. He, he, he does things different than any other head coach I've ever seen, and, and he's effective at it. So he, he's an enigma as a coach. Most fans that sit in these stands see the guy with the arms folded, the ice cool face. They don't see the emotion. And the George, after that Georgia game, I saw Lavelle kick a chair across the locker room. You know, he was ready to take people by the lapels. What kind of emotion have you seen? You know, not too much over the years, but I have seen when I've been able to talk to Lavelle uh, privately or to do an interview just one on one, a, a different man than you see prowling the sidelines. And it's a man who has a touch or a, or a grip on everything that's going on. But the interesting thing to me about Lavelle is is that he has he has the overall picture just in perfect focus. But I, I guess is that nearsighted? <laughs> he, he, he won't remember. I remember his son John once wouldn't give him a candy bar. We were in Japan and we were on uh, that first trip the BYU team took to Japan I think in 77. And I said, why won't you give it to him? And John said, well, okay, watch. And he gave him the candy bar because his dad was asking for a bite. <laughs> he said he will not give it back to me. And he didn't. He forgot where the candy bar came from and he ate the whole thing. And his, his family knows these idiosyncrasies of this man who is, who is an amazingly warm person off the football field. Lee, oh. in 84, he wins it all. Uh, everybody, every coach's dream is to win the, the national championship. In 84, you were there uh, against Bo Schembechler in Michigan. Didn't he let loose a little bit that night at all? Well, Bo Schembechler had, didn't have very many kind of things to say about BYU, especially for the offensive holding. And I remember a couple of days after that, I was talking to Lavelle, and I thought he would just unload on Schembechler. And instead, he talked about what a good guy Bo Schembechler is, how people don't know the real Bo, and how he would help, was helping his son get into medical school. Uh, I think it was back at Michigan or somewhere back there where he had influence. So even there, he sort of saw a different picture than a lot of uh, the rest of us might have thought he'd, he'd see. Lavelle Edwards, no doubt, one of a kind. What do you remember, maybe that makes you, makes you smile, that uh, maybe your fondest remembrance of the man? I'll tell you, the thing I think that, that uh, that shows the human side of Lavelle Edwards is several times I've come down to interview him in his office and I'll just get sat down and invariably we'll talk about golf courses or Willie Nelson's music or something he's interested in or his sons John and Jim or his daughters and then before too long and I can be in mid-sentence he'll say let's go and he'll go out and we'll hop in his cougar but he doesn't say anything. He doesn't say, come on, we're going to get a Coke or I'll buy or anything. He just says, let's go. And uh, he, he marches to his own drummer. And I just smile when I think about Lavelle Edwards because I think that's the only way he's able to have held this whole thing together is because he hears what he wants to hear and he does what he wants to do. He's a remarkable head coach as a result. I think probably Lavelle Edwards wasn't cut out to be an assistant coach. I think he was cut out to be a head coach.